Good morning. My name is Steve Frank. I'm an anesthesiologist at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I run our hospital's bloodless medicine and surgery program for the last 10 years. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> and here we go. I'm privileged to be a speaker at the meeting this year. Uh, the topic is bloodless care in critical care medicine and how education is key for the anesthesiologist. So here's my disclosures. Um, I'm on PBM committees for three national societies. I've been on advisory boards for three different companies. And the history of bloodless medicine at Johns Hopkins goes deep. Um, back in 1977, uh, Denton Cooley, who completed medical school and residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, he, he's also uh, known to implant the first artificial heart. But in 1977, he reported over 500 cases of cardiac surgery without blood transfusion uh, for Jehovah's Witness patients. And back then, um, they were impressed that mortality was only 10.7%. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Denton Cooley is considered the father of bloodless medicine. And here we are 45 years later, and at our institution today, uh, we have the Center for Bloodless Medicine and Surgery. And for about 10 years, we've been providing the best care for patients without transfusion uh, when they are interested in that type of medical treatment. Now, what I wanna emphasize is that bloodless care is not simply withholding blood. In fact, uh, there's a lot in common with patient blood management and uh, bloodless medicine and surgery is designed to avoid allogeneic transfusions completely whereas patient blood management is designed to reduce unnecessary transfusions. And they do have very much in common that we'll review during this talk because we use the same principles to either reduce or avoid transfusions. So first, who can't be transfused? Uh, about 90% of our patients uh, are not transfusable because of personal or religious reasons. And about 10% either have alloantibodies or no blood available, uh, at least compatible cross-match blood available. And when you talk to the Jehovah's Witness patients, uh, they really divide the blood components into two different categories. And those are the major fractions uh, in the red portion of this diagram uh, that they consider unacceptable, like red cells, plasma, and platelets, as well as leukocytes or whole blood. And then the minor fractions shown with the green arrows uh, that are considered to be a personal choice, for example, albumin, uh, cryoprecipitate, uh, prothrombin complex concentrate, these are considered to be a personal choice as are the uh, blood substitutes like uh, hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers. And in our experience, about 90% of our Jehovah's Witness patients will accept these minor fractions. So I often say that uh, we used to think that Jehovah's Witnesses were crazy uh, back until 1984. Uh, when that was the most dangerous year to have a transfusion because you can see HIV in green and hepatitis C in red uh, hit their absolute peak uh, prevalence in the blood supply in the United States. So about 1% of the blood units in the U.S. Uh, could transmit these life-threatening viruses. And since then, uh, blood's gotten much safer, but you can see many other uh, infectious disease agents have come out, uh, such as babesiosis, 
uh, the Zika virus, uh, et cetera. And so now we, we do our best to test for these pathogens, uh, but the risk is not zero. So <clears throat> in a recent review article uh, that we published in the journal Anesthesiology, uh, we reviewed the primary methods uh, for avoiding transfusion uh, when transfusion is not an option. And we like to divide the uh, techniques into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative interventions. Uh, for example, preoperative anemia is a hot topic uh, and treating pre-op anemia is critical in patients who want to avoid transfusion. Uh, however, the intraoperative and the postoperative techniques are primarily involved with keeping the blood in the patient. In fact, uh, 12 of the 16 methods on this table here uh, involve keeping the blood in the patient. And uh, this is our motto when it comes to bloodless medicine, because all the EPO and all the iron in the world uh, can't make up for uh, a large blood loss uh, during surgery. Uh, so we, we like to stop the bleed and keep the blood in the patient. In fact, uh, we've noticed that when surgeons focused harder on, on hemostasis, uh, when they try harder, blood loss goes down. Uh, in fact, uh, I say that blood loss is sometimes inversely proportional uh, to how hard the surgeons try because uh, when they tie off small bleeders and use topical hemostatics and uh, do meticulous surgical technique, they often lose half as much blood. So for example, uh, we did this complex spine fusion with um, multiple level uh, of hardware placement, uh, including a, a corpectomy and an interbody fusion without transfusion in a Jehovah's Witness patient. Uh, and I counted eight different devices here that the surgeon used uh, to keep the blood in the patient, uh, including a patient warming device, which we'll talk about in a minute, multiple different cautery devices, uh, and uh, even a bone scalpel device. In fact, uh, maintaining normothermia is critical uh, to reduce bleeding. Uh, we've known for years that patients bleed more below a core temperature of 35 degrees centigrade, uh, but recently we even have good evidence that patients bleed more below 36 degrees centigrade and that even with mild hypothermia of only one degree uh, of hypothermia, uh, blood loss increases uh, by 16%. And this is from a meta-analysis. In fact, there was a 22% increased risk of transfusion with even one degree centigrade of hypothermia in this meta-analysis. So uh, maintaining normal thermia is critical and keeping the blood in the patient. Another way to keep the blood in the patient is to collect the blood patients lose during surgery into a cell salvage device uh, like this. And we've shown that cell saver blood is not only beneficial uh, to keeping the blood in the patient, but it's also a higher quality of blood compared to banked blood uh, because it's only been outside the body for two or three hours, uh, hasn't been stored in the blood bank for up to six weeks, like allogeneic red cells. So we've written a few review articles on cell salvage, and uh, there are multiple devices on the market, of course. Uh, but we've also shown that when you measure 2,3 DPG levels in cell saver blood shown in green, uh, they were identical to fresh pre-op patient blood shown in dark blue. Uh, however, stored blood or banked blood, um, even when it's stored for a week or two in the blood bank, uh, develops a deficiency in 2,3-DPG, 
uh, of about 90% of the normal level. And this causes a left shift in the hemoglobin oxygen curve for banked blood. In fact, uh, this left shift for banked blood shown here uh, did not occur in cell saver blood. And uh, the left shift makes it more difficult for banked blood to offload oxygen at the tissue level. However, cell saver blood was as good as fresh blood. So our paper was written up in the media about recycled blood or cell saver blood being better than donated blood or banked blood uh, for transfusions. Uh, they said we recycle a lot of things, paper, plastic, metal, but we can also recycle and give patients back their own blood, uh, which is a higher quality transfusion. So in the critical care unit, uh, patients lose a lot of blood just for lab testing every day. And we took a survey in the five adult ICUs at Johns Hopkins Hospital on how much blood patients lose to lab testing every day. And it turns out that about 60 mLs a day are either sent to the lab or thrown in the trash as wasted discard when we clear the lines uh, to get a clean sample. And so 60 mLs a day is just over 1% of a five liter adult blood volume, uh, which by the way, 1% uh, is how much erythropoiesis we have every day. We destroy and create about 1% of our red blood cells. So you're basically canceling out any benefits of erythropoiesis by sending this much blood to the lab. Uh, the neuro ICU has these inline devices uh, that return the wasted discard, and they were able to cut the blood loss in half. But we've switched to smaller phlebotomy tubes throughout the hospital. Uh, we've gone to the medium-sized pediatric tubes that hold between two and four mLs. Uh, for Jehovah's Witness patients, we often use the very smallest tubes, uh, the neonatal tubes that hold 0.5 mLs. And let me point out that 0.5 mLs is 5% uh, of the blood or 1 20th of the blood uh, contained in this adult size 10 milliliter tube over here on the left. Uh, so we can dramatically reduce blood loss and keep the blood in the patient by using smaller phlebotomy tubes. Another way to keep the blood in the patient is tranexamic acid, uh, which is a antifibrinolytic. It's been around for about 50 years. Uh, however, only in the last decade has it been used uh, as and been called a game changer uh, in the orthopedic world. Uh, to reduce bleeding and transfusions. Uh, in fact, when we started giving tranexamic acid back in 2014 uh, for our joint replacements, we had this dramatic decrease in red cell utilization. Uh, also, we hired new surgeons and randomized trials came out in the New England Journal about that time showing lower hemoglobins were safe. Uh, so tranexamic acid played a major role. So another option that we sometimes use when we run out of options and patients develop severe life-threatening anemia uh, is a hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. Uh, and the only one that's still available for compassionate use right now is the one called Hemopure. Uh, Sanguinate didn't make it uh, to the market and is no longer available. Uh, Hemopure is still trying to make it to the market. It's a, a polymerized a bovine hemoglobin molecule uh, that carries oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, and can be used uh, when uh, allogeneic blood is not an option. So preoponemia is really important uh, when patients can't be transfused. So the question arises, uh, what is an adequate preoperative hemoglobin? Uh, and the, the answer is it depends on the case. 
In fact, um, one project we worked on recently is to calculate the optimal preoperative target hemoglobin. And the way we've done this is to take the allowable blood loss formula that we all learned in uh, anesthesia training, and we solved the formula algebraically uh, for the preoperative hemoglobin shown here on the left. Uh, and if you have uh, an allowable blood loss uh, or an estimated blood loss, uh, plus an estimated blood volume and a, uh, the lowest tolerated post-op hemoglobin, you can calculate the optimal target preoperative hemoglobin. So if you use this formula that, that we derived uh, to create this nomogram, uh, I'll give you an example. If you have a patient who's 100 kilograms and you're going to lose a liter of blood during surgery, the preop hemoglobin that you need is only uh, about nine grams per deciliter. But if the patient's 50 kilos and uh, scheduled to lose a liter of blood, uh, they're going to need a preop hemoglobin of about 11 grams per deciliter. So we've used this formula and nomogram uh, to calculate the optimal pre-op target hemoglobin uh, that we aim for before surgery. And the way we do that is uh, we use an erythropoietic order set that we built into the um, electronic medical record at Johns Hopkins <clears throat> that contains recommended doses of intravenous iron, uh, erythropoietin, and also folic acid and vitamin B12. Uh, this is primarily used for inpatients. Uh, for outpatients, we tend to use a different iron compound uh, called Infed or iron dextran. Uh, it's a low molecular weight iron dextran, and we can give an entire one gram dose uh, in a one single visit. So how do patients do when they don't accept transfusions? Um, so in 2014, we had a preliminary report on clinical outcomes in our bloodless program. And we compared uh, the first 300 bloodless patients to a matched group of controls. And we found that with ischemic respiratory renal thrombotic events, uh, there was no difference. Uh, they did as well as patients accepting blood. There was a trend towards less hospital-acquired infections, and there was a lower mortality rate in the bloodless group, but we weren't powered to look at mortality uh, with this small sample size. Also, we noted about a 12% decrease in cost with bloodless care uh, compared to the match control group. Uh, so it is uh, that you achieve the same or better outcomes uh, at the same or lower cost. But now, just recently, we've updated our outcomes database. We have four times as, as many cases, uh, four more years of enrollment, and we've refined our methods of treatment. So just last month, in the uh, themed issue of anesthesia analgesia, uh, we had an updated report on clinical outcomes and cost for patients who decline allogeneic transfusions. And so uh, we had uh, 1,100 patients in the bloodless group, about 700 medical patients and 400 surgical patients. And you can see uh, <clears throat> that none of the bloodless patients were transfused. And the nadir hemoglobin was uh, about half a gram lower in the bloodless group. Um, and about 8% of the medical patients had hemoglobin nadirs less than five, uh, but only 1% of the surgical patients had nadir hemoglobins less than five. So we definitely learned to keep the blood in the patient. When we look at a uh, composite morbidity uh, and mortality, we found the same 
or perhaps lower incidence of morbidity and mortality um, in the bloodless group. Uh, the uh, p-values are less than 0.05 uh, in, in the medical patients. Uh, so um, definitely a better outcome with bloodless care for the medical patients, but about the same outcome in surgical patients. When we looked at the individual morbid events uh, for all patients, uh, infection was the one that stands out. Uh, it's hospital acquired infections uh, that were lower in the bloodless group. In fact, in the medical bloodless patients, uh, infection was about half the incidence uh, compared to the control group who received transfusions. Uh, and there's even a mechanism to explain this because allogeneic blood has an immunosuppressive effect uh, called transfusion-related immune modulation. Uh, and that's probably what puts patients at more risk for infection after allogeneic transfusion. In fact, uh, in 2014, there was a meta-analysis uh, of uh, liberal versus restrictive transfusion studies showing a higher incidence of healthcare-associated infection uh, after liberal transfusion with red cells. So our findings are definitely believable uh, and consistent with prior research. Uh, so if I'm gonna summarize this talk, uh, bloodless care is not simply withholding blood from patients. It's really uh, about 16 different methods, uh, about 12 of which involve keeping the blood in the patient uh, to reduce bleeding. Uh, and also, we have a major focus on treating preoperative and postoperative anemia uh, with erythropoietic therapy. So uh, this guy comes to our hospital twice a day to deliver blood uh, at Johns Hopkins. And uh, this is before blood management on the left uh, and after patient blood management on the right. So we're definitely saving on blood products with patient blood management. And here's what it looks like for bloodless care. Uh, we definitely do more with less uh, and we achieve either the same or better outcomes at either the same or lower cost. And there's no doubt that uh, bloodless medicine is a team sport. Uh, here's our team visiting the Watchtower in uh, New York. Uh, at their new Warwick facility a few years ago. Uh, and here's our team presenting uh, at the SABA meeting in Las Vegas uh, just about a month ago. And we had six abstracts at that meeting uh, that involved uh, providing care without transfusions. And um, including the paper that I just presented uh, from last month, we're up to... Um, nine peer-reviewed publications in the last nine years. Uh, so about one paper a year from our group uh, on optimizing care uh, for patients where transfusion is not an option. And <clears throat> with that, uh, I'd like to thank the group for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there live because I'm traveling uh, to speak out of town on the day I'm scheduled. So I hope this recording will suffice and uh, it is truly an honor to be with you this morning. Thank you much.